Hear me? Is it on? Uh, Professor Kachu then um, held the uh, research position at Rutgers University and became a faculty member at uh, Berkeley in the late 90s. And then he moved to Stanford uh, for a faculty position. Kachu has many awards and honors. He is uh, well known for finding, for example, the first, um, the first models of the cosmological constant within string theory. He, um, he won the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Fellowship among his awards and the ACIPA Outstanding Young Physicist Prize in 2008. And um, Professor Kachu um, has discovered many connections to string theory and condensed matter physics and cosmology, especially um, in regards to the study of extra dimensions in string theory. And uh, today you will tell us about the physics and mathematics of the moonshine. Please. Right. Thanks for the introduction. It's always a pleasure to be here at Berkeley. And um, I won't start by mentioning the, uh, the outcome of the big game. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, right, I'm talking about a subject that, that, that may seem unconventional. Probably most of you, even, even those of you who are senior faculty, have never heard a physics colloquium about moonshine. Uh, the moonshine that's intended here is not the kind that would lead you to believe that there will be free alcohol samples in the talk, so you're out of luck. That's why you came. And in fact, a lot of the talk will be extremely introductory, just explaining what moonshine is, what are the objects that it relates, and why it's interesting. Um, to the extent that I'll say anything new, it's based on material that was taught to me by some um, treasured collaborators, some mathematicians, Brandon Chang, who's either in Amsterdam or Cambridge, John Duncan, who's actually moved from Case now, and Sarah Harrison, who is my student and is now at Harvard, and then a bunch of postdocs and students at Stanford who keep teaching me new things uh, about related ideas. Okay, so again, this is an unfamiliar subject, and it involves maybe three sets of unfamiliar objects, so I want to keep the big picture in mind. The talk will be elementary. I promise you'll understand it. But before I give an outline, let me tell you what the big picture is going to be. Uh, in the center, we'll have string theory, because I'm a string theorist. But on the sides, we'll have three different, very beautiful classes of objects, all of which really rate their own entire classes. Uh, on the one hand, we have group theory, the study of symmetries. Here's a picture of the root lattice of one of the most beautiful groups, the eight. On another hand, we have something called modular forms, which arise in the study of number theory. And I don't expect that you know what these are, and I'll give a very brief physical introduction. Uh, and on yet a third hand, if you have three hands, uh, we have algebraic geometry, which is the abstract study of certain kinds of shapes and surfaces, which arise in string theory because the theory, for better or worse, has extra dimensions. So we'll talk about mysterious relations between these three a priori totally distinct areas of mathematics. And the, the way string theory enters is, in fact, it mediates these relationships. They were discovered in part in string theory or proved through the use of string theory. So moonshine is really just the name for the subject that relates all of these classes of objects. And the way they're related is special backgrounds of string theory, some solution of the equations of motion of string theory, relates all the classes of objects and provides the unifying structure. An important point about this talk, as opposed to many colloquia, is that there will be no triumphant punchline at the end. We know the relations are there. I'll pre present some of the evidence, and it's overwhelming evidence, but we don't know why. So the talk's introductory. I'll start with a very elementary discu discussion of symmetries and groups. Then I'll give a string theory primer. So this is the 10-minute version of Polchinski's two volumes. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take you in, in the study of moonshine to about the mid-1990s, when the first case was understood. And in fact, a lot of the best work on this was done here in Berkeley. Uh, and then I'll tell, tell you about why I'm giving this talk today, about uh, a reincarnation of this subject, a reinvigoration that's really taken place in the last four or five years. OK, so, so symmetries are a familiar object to any physicist. They're an important ingredient in nature at many scales and in many subfields of physics. 
Uh, as children, you might, if you ever look at snowflakes up close, remark on the symmetries of a snowflake. Uh, in condensed matter physics, you might encounter uh, the lattice symmetries of solids, which were classified crystalline symmetries. Uh, here we have an emergent symmetry of some sort of uh, a triangular lattice and a vortex lattice that emerges in a superconductor. And of course, in particle physics, you know, there's this, um, the particle physicist analog of the periodic table with quarks, leptons, force carriers, the boton and the weak force carriers, uh, and now the Higgs particle, which was discovered at great expense to the taxpayers. Um, but this, this table for a real particle physicist, we don't really need to remember the name so much as the root theory that underlies the symmetric structure. Now, it's important to distinguish between two different cases, at least philosophically. Uh, with vortex lattices, for instance, of type 2 superconductors, of which I showed a picture here, and I stole this from Seamus Davis's webpage at Cornell, uh, the symmetric structure is emergent. You start at high temperatures, you lower the temperature. In some regime of B field and temperature, vortices will form, and they spontaneously form a, a symmetric lattice, which minimizes the free energy. But in other cases, uh, the symmetries that we guess actually help us in what we think of as the basic formulation of the theory. Okay, so in high energy theory, which is where I grew up, the hope has always been not so much that there are just emergent symmetries, though that might be the case, but also that there are basic symmetries of the theory, and that the most fundamental way to understand the theory will be to first state what the symmetries are, and then those will dictate the rest of the theory. That philosophy might be wrong. These, are, these views of emergence versus Fundamental symmetries are in some conflict, and it's not clear which one will turn out to be deeper. But in any case, there have been great examples in, in recent years. Uh, the low energy world, shown in this picture, for particle physicists, you know, it's not so symmetric. These particles have various masses and coupling constants. The forces are not unified in any way. But it looks a little more symmetric when you take into account the Higgs mechanism. So the, the postulate is that there was uh, a fundamental Higgs field, at least as far as we can tell. In the early universe, it sat at the top of this potential hill. Symmetries were restored between some of the existing forces. And it's only at low temperatures and at late times that the symmetries break to the even less symmetric structure we see today. Uh, another example where we hope symmetries will emerge eventually in the study of particle physics been a paradigm that's guided the field for 30 years, and we don't know if it's true, uh, is in the idea of grand unification. So we have uh, the strong nuclear force, which binds the quarks. You have the electromagnetic force, the most familiar in everyday life. You have the, the weak nuclear force, which leads to beta decay, alpha emission. And you know, they look pretty disparate in their strength. Right? Hence, one is called strong, one is called weak. But in fact, the strength of these forces change with the energy scale at which you probe them. Okay, so the electromagnetic coupling constant, alpha, we all learn in freshman electromagnetism, it's 1 over 137. But if you go down the street from my office to Slack, where they sat on the Z pole and produced many Z particles in 1990, they were sitting at you know, the right energy to produce a Z, a Z pair, so 180 GeV, in the center of mass. And the effective electromagnetic coupling measured there, in very precise data, is more like 1 over 128. The coupling changes with the effective energy of the process in which it in which it's appearing. And so the couplings change effectively with energy, and there's some hope that they may unify at a high energy scale, giving rise, giving rise to an emergent symmetry that unifies the forces. Now, I'm not going to talk about that. That's an old subject. It's a great subject, but it's not my subject today. So an ambitious question that we would need to answer a priori to really understand the full set of possible physical theories is can we classify all possible symmetries that might occur in a physical system and then stratify the space of possibilities by symmetry and maybe understand the most symmetric systems first? Now, that's stated in Lehman's terms. The word symmetry is a little too imprecise. So I'm going to abstract the question a bit. Let's consider a simple example of symmetries. Take an equilateral triangle with vertices A, B, C. What do we mean by symmetries? We mean by operations that we could imagine doing to this triangle that would take it back to itself. And let's restrict ourselves to the plane. So one thing we could do is rotate it by 60, sorry, you know, through 120, 240, or 360 degrees, leaving the place. Another thing we could do is, is flip it across one of these axes. Here, for instance, exchanging B and C while we can get fixed. So these are all operations we could do. And because they're symmetries, 
If we do one and then another, we'll still get back the same triangle. So you can compose them in a natural way. So if you now label each option, rotate by 120 degrees, rotate by 240 degrees, flip across the axis bisecting A and, and the, the BC line, if you label these by abstract symbols, which represent elements of a mathematical object called a group, you could just work out how the symmetry is composed once and for all. If you first rotate, then flip, here's what you did to the triangle. And the result is a sort of boring analog of the multiplication table. Okay, here it is. There are six symmetries of the triangle, including the identity do nothing to the triangle. And this is what happens if you first rotate by 120 degrees uh, and then do a flip on the line that goes through the B vertex. So that abstract object represented very concretely in a multiplication table with certain properties is called a group. More formally, groups are sets of operations like this that can be combined or multiplied. The identity element that does nothing is always in the group. Uh, every element in a group has an inverse. If you rotate one way, you can rotate back the other way. You rotate to the right, you can rotate to the left. And multiplication is associated. Now, symmetries of physical systems, it turns out, correspond to groups. They're groups of transformations that leave the system invariant. And you've all seen this. This is quite basic for some of you. Some of you might not have used this language before. But familiar examples are the rotation groups of space. You know, we think space is symmetric under rotations if we weren't sitting in this room, but we're in vacuum in outer space. Uh, translation groups, say in crystals, uh, crystallographic groups, right. Now, the reason that this is a useful notion is that when we have a symmetry, the system preserves some symmetry, maybe a discrete symmetry like a lattice, then the excitations of the system, the, the low energy particles, are well classified by how they transform under the symmetry, how they break the symmetry if they're present. And again, just to make sure we're all on the same page, this is very familiar. When you first take quantum mechanics, the first example of a new quantum number that was discovered is the spin quantum number. And this tells us how particles behave under spatial rotations. So we happen to live in three plus one dimensions, as far as we can tell. So the rotation group is an SU2. Uh, the electron is spin a half. It can be up or down along, say, the z-axis. That's a doublet representation of SU2. But more generally, you could take systems of many electrons and add their angular momenta and get spin j representations of SU2. So the spin governs the dimension of the representation of the group, the number of different states that transform into each other under rotations. Spin j means there's two j plus one states. For j equals a half, you get the familiar up and down of the electron. Again, um, that's a very prosaic example. There are much fancier examples. A standard hope from my youth was that still hidden symmetries of nature might end up unifying this sort of increasingly messy picture into just one big rotationally symmetric multiple of a big enough group. Okay, it so happens that if you add up all the particles here in the right way, the number 16 appears and suggests it's a single group SO10. That's an old idea, it hasn't yet borne fruit, but we can hope that it will. So anyway, the study of these symmetries has played an important role in both particle and condensed matter physics. So anyway, can we classify the possible groups and see if there are interesting examples that might play well with other areas of physics? Okay, there are obviously at least two different questions here, two different kinds of beasts, because there are two kinds of groups. There are the ones that have continuous parameters like rotations. You could rotate through one degree or pi degrees. But then there are also finite groups, like the symmetries of the triangle, which have just discrete operations. So here's a continuous group of rotations. Um, but the symmetries of the triangle are some other kind of piece. And I'm going to be concerned with the finite symmetry groups today. So the ones with some finite discrete set of operations. Now, the reason this is a good subject to talk about now, but would have been harder to talk about 30 years ago, is that today, really as of the mid-1980s, and increasingly uh, in a way that's, that's parsable by humans, the finite groups have been classified. Very roughly, all the finite groups are built out of certain atoms of symmetry, which are called the simple finite groups. And the way you should think of this at the level of precision for a colloquium is that you know, all, all integers are products of primes. There's a unique prime factorization. Similarly, all the finite groups are, in some sense, products of these, these prime groups, the simple finite groups. They were classified by mathematicians by the end of the 20th century. Some of the work was done here. Uh, well, I mean in, in Evans. Um, 
the, the proof spans something like 15,000 pages in the original form done by 100 mathematicians. Nobody carries it in their head, but it's being summarized these days in, in just a few volumes. So there's this list of objects now. And given the list, what do you do with it? Well, you look for the most interesting objects. So the list includes 18 infinite series. Infinite series are usually not that interesting. Okay, the simplest example of an infinite series is just clock arithmetic, uh, though with prime clocks. So we're familiar to arithmetic mod 12 because of the way we held time. Uh, if instead we did this mod 5 or mod 7, it would be a prime clock. And that kind of arithmetic forms one of the infinite families of each one. And there's 17 others like that. But more interestingly for us, when they finished all this work, there were some cases that just didn't fit in. So there are these, these 18 big families. And then there are some weird oddballs, 26 weird oddballs, uh, which don't really fit anywhere else. And so they called them sporadic. So these are the sporadic finite groups. And they kind of fit into a family like this. There's the biggest one, M. M here stands for monster. Uh, it's called the monster because it's so big. It has a number of elements or order given by approximately 8 times 10 to the 53. Okay? That means that if we tried to make the table depicting how you compose monster elements, it would be 10 to the 53 by 10 to the 53. So I'm not going to present the table in today's talk. Anyway, it sits up here. It's the biggest one of these by order. And many of the other sporadic groups fit into it by embedding. They're subgroups. Then there's a few guys off here who don't really fit in. Um, they're like the mathematicians in high school. Uh, they're called the pariahs. So here's an important question. Okay, given um, some set of unique objects in an otherwise regular world, there are two possibilities. Okay, one is that these are deep and important structures and they're singled out for a reason. And this is often what you hope in physics, that the world is going to be unique in some beautiful way. Um, another possibility is that they're mistakes of God. God created the world in six days. That's not a lot of time. Maybe the groups didn't quite get finished right, and there are 26 mistakes. Okay, and what that would really mean, okay, the, the, to be more serious, uh, an idea is fruitful if it plays well with other ideas. Do these play an important role in other parts of physics or other parts of math? If so, they're important. If not, they're not. So two of them are going to play a central role in our story today. Uh, here's the picture again. Here's the monster up here. Uh, something called the largest Mathieu group, M24, whose order is a mere 244,823,040, will be really central. And then there are some smaller groups, also discovered by Mathieu, uh, almost by accident in the 19th century to play a role. Now, the important thing about these groups is that they'll turn out to be basic symmetries of some of the most interesting backgrounds of string theory that have yet been studied. Uh, so now, you're supposed to have at the beginning of any colloquium some kind of ad. The ad should involve some very famous person advertising your subject. Um, it's hard to get more famous than Freeman Dyson in theoretical physics. So this is my advertisement. Uh, Dyson in 1983, uh, already then this subject was, was unpopular, so this was written in an article called Unfashionable Pursuits. Um, but he said, I have a sneaking hope, a hope unsupported by any facts or any evidence, that sometime in the 21st century physicists will stumble upon the monster group built in some unsuspected way into the structure of the universe. Um, I'll be consistent with parts of his quote. For instance, there will be few facts or evidence in most of my talk. Um, but we will talk about the monster and why you might suspect it could show up in physics. So we'll see at least, I can't promise that it has anything to do with the real world, but it is deeply enshrined in some of the most basic objects of math and mathematical physics. Uh, and I'll, I'll present some new evidence along these lines today. Okay, so we, we've hit one of the subjects I promised to introduce, symmetries. Uh, here's the, another subject that will be central, string theory. Okay, so we'll just need the most basic facts about string theory for this club week. Uh, you probably have all heard of string theory at some point or another. All string theories are just theories where instead of elementary particles, instead of a point-like electron or a point-like quark being the basic object, the basic constituents are in some sense tiny closed loops or open jump ropes of string. Um, so here's the open jump rope option, the two ends of the open string. Uh, here's the closed loop option, closed strings. And we'll mostly talk about the closed strings. The most basic kind of interaction that you can have with particles is a particle can split into two. The most basic interaction you can have with a closed loop of string is that if we think of this as the spatial slice, so it's a circle, the string propagates along and then the pair of pants splits and you get the two legs and so there's this pants diagram that splits one string into 
the two. It's sort of a fatal version of the Feynman graph. Now, in normal particle theories, um, you then sum over Feynman graphs with various world lines. So again, if you're a theorist, you know, maybe the leading contribution to a, a process is a tree diagram. There are no closed loops in the graph. Uh, and then you get to one loop, two particles exchange some virtual stuff, and eventually two particles come out. Um, and then you get your graduate student, and here's two loops, and here's three loops, and so on and so forth. Okay. So in string theory, these all get fattened into a sort of elegant sum over topologies because all the lines get fattened. So the tree graph is now two pairs of pants glued together at the waist. But you could introduce one donut hole or two donut holes or so on and so forth to get smooth Riemann surfaces with boundary where the external particles are that describe the Feynman diagrams of string theory. An interesting fact about this way of viewing Feynman diagrams is that in the fattened version, some of the choices you'd have had here, for instance, you could have had a vertex with seven things coming out, really don't exist in this kind of picture. The seven vertex wouldn't give a new way of sort of triangulating the Riemann surfaces. Now, consistent string theories famously predict the existence of extra dimensions of space. I'm not going to belabor that theory. You've heard it if you've heard of string theory. Um, why do we talk about it then? Isn't it ruled out? We don't see extra dimensions of space. Well, the best thing I can say if you want to make a real world string theory is that perhaps some of those dimensions are very tiny. After all, in cosmology, the real question is why any dimensions get big, not whether there could be small ones. That's the best I can say. Anyway, it's a mathematical fact. These theories predict extra dimensions. Uh, the earliest versions, strings with just bosons living on the world sheet, whose spectrum in space time, whose spectrum of excitations are just bosonic, um, predicted 26 dimensions. They happen to also be catastrophically unstable. Huge progress was made in reducing the number of dimensions to 10 in the mid 80s uh, by adding supersymmetry to the superstring. There were, in fact, by some standard way of counting, five different kinds of supersymmetric string or superstring. That's the mid 80s. And by the mid 90s, we realized that, in fact, those five different kinds really are, are all different limits of the same kind of theory. So there's a larger theory, which by, by sort of consensus is often called M theory. And by squishing it around in various ways, by making couplings in the theory large or small, strong coupling or weak coupling, or by putting it on a circle and making the circle big or small, you can get to the different limits in different ways. So there's sort of one kind of super string theory. Though there, that this one kind of theory may have any solution. <coughs> okay, so this is my lightning review of string theory. We have super strings. They naturally live in something like 10 dimensions, minus space and one time. So then to get physics in lower dimensions, what would you do? Well, you have to assume that for whatever reason today, of the nine spatial dimensions, some of them are compact. Not only compact, but small enough that we haven't seen them. So what you do is generalize the idea of Kluze and Klein. Okay, already in the early 1920s, Kluze and Klein had the following idea. Today we have a unification problem. We have the weak force, strong force, electromagnetism, gravity, all different strengths. It's very ugly. In 1920, they had a unification problem because they had electromagnetism and the gravitational force. Different strengths, they look very different, very ugly. And what Kluze and Klein realized is that aesthetically speaking, you can improve the situation. If instead of saying you have Einstein's theory of gravity and Maxwell's electromagnetism, you pretended the world was five dimensional, four space dimensions in one time, but that one of the dimensions of space was curled up on a circle. That came in the second paper, the first paper, had it not compact. And so at distances long compared to the size of the extra circle, you get effective four dimensional space. But it turns out pure Einstein theory in the higher dimensions reduces when you correctly put it on this circle and count all the degrees of freedom to both Maxwell theory and Einstein theory in four dimensions. So you'd unify the two at the cost of adding an extra dimension. This theory is in disastrous conflict with phenomenology. Okay, so it didn't work then, it doesn't work now, I'm not selling it to you, except as an explanation of the idea. So string theory is much fancier. There are 10 dimensions, not five. And so the fancier string theory incarnations of this kind of idea are that above each point in our three plus one dimensional almost flat space, we probably open to sitter space, not quite flat space, there are six hidden dimensions. And, and string theorists often, for reasons we'll get to, take them to be curled up on a special kind of space. Now a circle isn't good enough. It's only one dimensional, you need a six dimensional space. And those six dimensional spaces that string theorists like most are often called Calabi-Yale manifolds, 
This is the name of two mathematicians to lobby conjectures that a certain class of spaces exist and he outproved it. So we'll be interested in the simplest possible question you can ask about strings in any map. Okay. We'll be interested in whether the string states are organized in representations of some beautiful hidden symmetry. So in the 1920s, you have the electron, and through various experiments, you discover there's a spin quantum number. There's a representation of SU2 that's interesting. We want to do the same thing with string states and some simple backgrounds. Ask, do the strings know about some extra degrees of freedom? Are they organized under some symmetry? So to do that, we should ask, what is the spectrum of particles that you get out of a string theory? And then we ask whether they're organized in multiples of some symmetry group. Well, very roughly, if you have a theory where the basic objects are strings, and that theory has been compactified on, say, a circle or a globby, a manifold something, so there are compact dimensions around, there are three different kinds of states you could imagine. Okay, the strings could be moving with some momentum even momentum in the extra dimensions, momentum along, say, an extra circle. Because they're extended objects, strings like rubber bands could wind around something. Okay, if you had a little tube, you could wind a rubber band around it maybe multiple times. Similarly, if there's a cylinder in space, a string could wind it maybe multiple times. So in addition to momentum along the cylinder, there could be winding around the cylinder. But then lastly, the string can oscillate. Here I've shown this for the open jump rope version, but obviously the closed string could also have Fourier modes. And so you see there's a lowest harmonic, but you could have you know, one node in the middle, or two nodes, or three nodes, or four nodes. And so you expand the shape of the string in a Fourier series, and you know, the nth excited state has an energy that scales with n. Now, the most basic data we would want to know about the string theory would be the full spectrum of those states, because that would predict what all the particles are because all the particles are made out of strings with some winding, some momentum, and some oscillator number. So these states will be organized in the tower by mass, with masses given in multiples of the tension, the basic tension of the string. In fact, the formula is quite simple. Okay, if you have a string state with momentum n along a dimension whose size is r, well, it includes the Klein theory. The momenta are quantized in units of 1 over r. So n units of momentum give mass squared n squared over r squared. If you wind a circle of radius r, then the energy cost is tension times radius of the circle. There's some 2 pi's. I'm setting 2 pi to 1. So the energy is winding times r, so the mass squared is winding squared r squared. And then if you have some number of oscillator modes, each oscillator excitation just costs the unit of energy. So you get a formula that says the mass squared goes like the momentum and the winding and the oscillator. A very simple formula. This is a schematic formula. It, it's the mass spectrum of a bosonic string on a circle of radius r. But it gives the right idea. You're just trying to count all the states by their energy and then write some kind of function telling you the spectrum of the theory. And in fact, that function is the most basic function that you would ask in physics. Given a physical system, what would you really like to know? You'd like to know all its energy levels. And you summarize those by giving a partition function. Okay, so in basic stat mech, what is the partition function? You take states at energy level or mass level n, uh, and you organize them in a function z with coefficient cn telling you the number of states at mass level n. This q is a formal variable, just keeping track of that. Maybe in more familiar language, you should think of q as the exponential of the mass of a string with unit oscillation number. And then think of this thing as being traced e to the minus beta h. So q is like e to the minus beta. This is just a partition function for the string, counting all the, all the energy. And this is exactly the formula from basic step mm -hmm. OK, we're still on the introduction. Um, but we're almost ready to get to the point where we see something surprising and beautiful. Okay, let's recall, maybe that's the wrong word if you're young enough, but there's, in fact, a famous relationship between two different things. One is the partition function of a quantum particle that beta equals 1 over kT. k is Boltzmann's constant. Temperature is T. And the other is the path integral for that same particle moving in periodic Euclidean time, where the radius of the periodic time is fixed by the temperature in the thermodynamic problem. Okay, so this is the famous equivalence 
that you hopefully learned in stat mech or in quantum mechanics or in both. But if you didn't learn it, let me make it intuitive in the following way. <coughs> what is the path integral? You have a particle with position Q of T. At T initial and T final, the initial and final times, we're going to fix that position. The particle is going to be some fixed position. And then in quantum mechanics, we're instructed to integrate over all paths that the particle could possibly take between the initial and final position. If we're in periodic time, then those positions are the same because it's the same final and initial time. Um, but we weight each path by the exponential of the action, the integral of the Lagrangian of Q and Q dot. So just again, for more intuition, if the Lagrangian is that of a standard particle moving in a potential V of Q with kinetic energy m Q dot squared, then well, we, we're instructed to go to Euclidean space. That changes the sign of the dot squared. And you end up with an integral that's Gaussian and damped dQ e to the minus mq dot squared plus u. So for a positive potential, this seems like a reasonable thing to try and evaluate. And you can. And what you see from this expression, this basically now looks like a Hamiltonian. Okay, I know I'm being a little sloppy, but this looks like mv squared plus v of q. And so you can see that this is basically just the trace of e to the minus beta h with a beta that goes like 2 pi r, the radius of The reason that we went through that derivation again is because we, we're changing the problem a little. We don't have a particle. We have a string. <laughs> so what is the string doing? Here it sits innocently at some time t initial. But we want to know the partition function. So we're going to compute the, part, the, 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 the path integral in periodic time. Here it moves in periodic time. And it comes back to the same position at the end. So what it sweeps out is now not a circle, but a torus, the surface of a donut. And now, instead of just a radius of the circle, there are two parameters that fix the shape of the torus, not just a radius. We can think of this in the following way. Suppose you wanted to make a torus for your child. What would you do? What you do is take a sheet of paper. This is a sort of oddly shaped piece of paper. And then you'd identify that side with that side and the top with the bottom. You just fold it like this, then fold it like that. That makes a torus. The statement is that up to conformal equivalence, which is the relevant thing here, um, you can get every torus in that way in the following sense. You take the infinite plane, you make a lattice in the infinite plane. By rotation and scaling, one lattice generator can be taken to be the vector 1 along the x-axis. And then the only question is what the other lattice basis element is. And that's a number tau with positive imaginary part, again, by rotation. So that suggests that for each choice of tau, a complex number with positive imaginary base, <coughs> there is a kind of torus. That's not quite correct, because given a lattice, you can make the same lattice by choosing different linear combinations of the basis vectors that happen to span the same space. So up to choice of basis, we've parameterized all tori. And the different choices of basis, the way to, to make the same lattice with different basis vectors, are parameterized by something called large diffeomorphisms, where instead of the parameter tau here, you have the parameter a tau plus b over c tau plus b, where a, b, c, and d are integers, and a, d minus b, c. You'll have to take my word for that or sit around and try to picture it afterwards. These transformations are famous. They're associated with a group, uh, a group called SL2z, because it's two by two matrices with integer entries. So what have we learned so far? The partition function, the simplest object you'd ever compute in a theory, just counting the number of states, that should summarize the spectrum, should behave well under SL2z. Because a human might care whether the picture looks like this or you chose a different linear combination of basis vectors, but the physics doesn't. It's a convention. And so if you write z as the sum of cn q to the n, with this q being e to the 2 pi i tau, so again, you should think of um, the imaginary part of tau as being like beta temperature. Then, with Cm as the number of mass states of mass level 1, the statement is that z of the SL2z transform torus should be the same as z of tau. z of a tau plus b over t tau plus b for any a, b, c, and b that satisfy our constraint should be z. 
Now, that's actually a famous equation. If you sit around and play with functions and try to write down functions that satisfy this, unless you're Poincaré, you'll have a hard time. Okay? But, but in fact, um, it's not that hard to do. These have a famous, uh, you know, famous role in mathematics, and they're known as modular functions uh, or modular forms. So when we have now reached a rudimento on these functions, okay, what we've learned is that string theory is a natural generator of these weird functions called modular forms that map you from the moduli space of possible tori uh, to the numbers. These are functions that are distinguished by obeying for every tau in the upper half plane uh, this kind of equation. F of A tau plus B over C tau plus C is up to a multiplic multiplication factor F of tau. K will be zero for us. If K weren't zero, we'd have a modular form instead of a modular function. What you should imagine is the following. You're used to functions that map any point in the complex plane into some other complex number. But here, because of SL2Z, any point in the complex plane can be mapped into a fundamental region by some SL2Z. That fundamental region looks like this keyhole thing that extends up to infinity here. And so what these functions are are functions that take each point in here to the complex number. Now, this is going to be the, um, the least thorough part of the talk. I just have to tell you that these functions, far from only appearing in string theory, have played a remarkably important role in number theory, uh, in part because the coefficients of their Q expansions, these CMs, tend to be simple expressions and in integers. And constraining these simple expressions by modularity can lead to statements, to, to proofs of statements in number theory. Let me say that in more plain English. It's hard to write down functions that do this. And in fact, in a well-defined sense for the right classes of functions at a fixed value of k, they form a finite dimensional space. So if you can make two functions whose coefficients you define differently, but you can prove both functions have the same value of k and transform nicely, with a finite number of tests, you can prove both, both functions are the same, and therefore that those expressions for coefficients have to always match. And that proves statements in number theory like every integer can be written as a sum of four squares. That's the simplest thing. A more dramatic example is that when Fermat's last theorem was proved at the end of the last century by this guy, okay, what he actually proved is a conjecture about properties of modular forms. Uh, there was a, a conjecture called the Taniyama Shimura conjecture. Um, I'll try to read it in English here. Uh, let E be a torus. It's a torus with integer coefficients in a defining equation. Um, for each n, let a n be the number of solutions to the equation defining the torus over the integer mod n. Okay, then you can make a modular form by taking that number of solutions mod n and making the power series the n. Okay, that was a little too simple, but that's roughly what the statement said. Now, the reason that the proof of this statement led to a proof of Fermat's last theorem is that a mathematician in Berkeley, Ken Rivet, had shown that if a solution to Fermat's equation exists, it can be used to construct an elliptic curve that will not be associated with a modular form by this recipe. Okay. And so proving this incredibly deep statement about modular forms as a spin-off led to a proof of Fermat's last theorem. OK, so now we're done with all the introductory stuff, and I can finally talk about moonshine. So let's, let's return to the monster. Remember, the monster is the largest of these sporadic finite groups. Its dimension, sorry, its order is something like 10 to the 50. Um, it was constructed in the late 1970s, not by writing down the multiplication table, but in a much more indirect and clever way. And one of the people thinking about this group in the late 70s was a mathematician, a Canadian named John McKay. He noticed the following coincidence. They hadn't yet constructed this group, but they knew some facts about the simplest particle multiples that could exist, the simplest representations. In every group, there could be a particle that's just invariant. It doesn't care about that symmetry. For the monster, which is a pretty big object, the first non-trivial place you can represent it is in 196,883 dimensions. And so the first dimension where you can get a representation is 196,883. So it's hard to visualize, but there it is. And then you get 21,296,896, and the numbers go up. Now, this is a very large object. Even the first non-trivial representation is hard to visualize, no matter how much you drink. Okay? And so McKay got tired of playing with this object. He decided to take a break one afternoon in 1978. And like most of us do when we take a break, he decided to read some number theory. <laughs> now, I just described to you that a central object in number theory is, is, is 
is modular form, that I'm not lying, they really do occur in number theory papers. And he noticed that in this number theory paper, he was, he was reading a, a famous modular function, the J function, finds J function occurred. And the authors in this paper presented the Taylor expansion of this function, the expansion in Q, right, the sum CN Q to the N. How does it start? Well, it starts with a simple pole. The J function has a simple pole, and you normalize that to one. Then there's a constant term. Constant terms aren't very interesting because they're modular in themselves. The constant doesn't transform under modular transformation. So this is by convention one, and this is boring. The next number he saw was 196884. And because he's just one of those people, uh, he noticed the remarkable feature that 196884 is not 196883, but it's pretty close. <laughs> okay, so now, if you're a physicist, and you see a one part in 10 to the fifth or 10 to the sixth coincidence, that's a PRL right there. <laughs> if you're a mathematician, um, it's nothing, but you get to write a letter. He chose to write a letter um, to John Thompson, a great group theorist who at the time was on sabbatical in Princeton at the Institute. John Thompson was a field medalist, a very powerful guy, so he could add even larger numbers. <laughs> <laughs> and he realized that 21493760, the second number in the Q expansion, is the sum of the first three dimensions of representations of the monster. Okay. And in fact, they noticed many other similar coincidences. OK, so in fact, much more generally, they found that if you take the simplest of modular functions, Klein's J function, the CNs have natural decompositions into dimensions of ARABs of the monster. Now, it's hard to, to emphasize what a shocking development this was. The modular functions have been popular in number theory since the 19th century. And it's a very well-developed subject, but very far from the study of sporadic groups. And the monster wasn't yet constructed and was certainly a very esoteric object, but here it was seemingly tied in some crucial way um, to the J function of Klein. Klein died around you know, 1900. Okay, so why would this ever happen? Well, following some more clever calculations that I won't explain here, if it became clear, and it'll become clearer to you in a second why it's clear, um, that you should postulate the existence of a graded infinite dimensional vector space. Okay, in plain, plain English, what does it mean? It means that you should postulate the existence of a Hilbert space of states, and you can grade states by energy. And at each energy level, there's some number of states. So we'll call this V natural. There's the state of energy minus one, which corresponds to the one over Q in this expansion. There are no states at Q to the zero, and then there's some vector spaces Vn, and the dimension of each VK is CK the coefficient here. You're postulating that there's a natural vector space that's graded this way, whose dimensions generate the J function when you take a trace. Now, where would you ever get an infinite dimensional state space associated with a Q expansion that has nice modular properties? Well, probably before this talk, only one or two of you would have answered this immediately. But unless you're already asleep, you know from the first 30 minutes of my talk what the answer to this question is. The whole point of string theory is that the simplest question you ask, what is the spectrum of string states, generates a Q expansion with nice modular properties. Okay, and so it became very natural to think, and remember this is the early 1980s now, before string theory was popular, that maybe there's a connection between a certain kind of string theory uh, and these observations. That turned out to be true. So here's the final story. I'll tell, tell you the final story. There's another miraculous object that enters. Strings can be in various backgrounds. They can move on circles or tori or the spaces. Uh, in this instance, what people consider as strings is something called a Leech lattice background. So what is the Leech lattice? Here's a natural question. Suppose you're a grocer and you want to pack oranges as densely as possible. But we're in string theory, so let's suppose you're a 24-dimensional grocer. Okay? Well, in 24 dimensions, there is a unique orange packing that's most dense. That's the packing according to the vertices of the leech lattice. If you take this lattice and you mod out R24 by it, you get a remarkably symmetric torus. And the claim is that strings in this background have a partition function given by Klein's J function. That counts the number of string states at each level in this background. And in fact, if you do the right thing to the background, I've lied a little bit. It's not quite the leech lattice. You modify Z2. They have a symmetry given by the monster. And so you have here a textbook explanation of what's going on. The string theory has monster symmetry, so the energy eigenstates form representations of the group, and that's why there are group representations in the J-point. 
OK, so this is a very peculiar bosonic string compactification to two dimensions. It beautifully explains the existence of monstrous moonshine at some level. It doesn't explain it deeply, but at least it makes it clear why there could be such an equivalent. Uh, precise mathematical conjectures were made about these relations by Conway and Norton, pictured here. And they were finally proved by Borchers, a mathematician in Berkeley, uh, leading to a Fields Medal in 1998. So I've explained this in a joking way, but the mathematics gets pretty deep. And it's deep enough that it led to a Fields Medal. On the other hand, it didn't lead to much physics. If you look at Polchinski's two volumes, this story is nowhere mentioned. If you look at Green, Schwartz, and Whitten, this story is nowhere mentioned. And that's because nobody cares about bosonic strings because they have a tachyon. And nobody cares about compact indications to two dimensions because we kind of want to stop at four. <laughs> OK, so finally I can tell you what's you. In the intervening years, since the mid-80s, the 90s, there has been, for better or worse, an intense focus on supersymmetric backgrounds of strings. There are two different reasons. One is many people hoped and still hope that we'll discover supersymmetry in nature. There's a second reason, which frankly is more and more the real reason I think the string theorists who work on this do, which is that the theory is very hard to solve. It's very hard to understand. You should start in the simplest places. And these are the simplest places. So if you can't understand it here, you're not going to understand it anywhere. And so you study these. Now, perhaps the most famous class of models that preserve supersymmetry are compactifications of the 10D string on something called Kalabi on manifolds. Again, named after Kalabi who conjectured that they exist and Yahoo proved it. What Kalabi actually conjectured is for each of a certain class of spaces, something called Kaler manifolds with vanishing first turn class, there would be a solution to Einstein's equations in vacuum, a Ricci flat metric. And Yao proved that that was true. There was a Ricci flat metric, so a solution to the vacuum Einstein equation. Uh, for each choice of the data in Kalabi. And then this is like Brian Green's picture of what's going on. That's a Kalabi L manifold sliced in some appropriate way to make it colorful. Now, what's the most simple example? The most trivial example would be a torus. A two torus is, is Ricci flat, it's locally the plane. So a four torus would also be Ricci flat, a six torus. The first non trivial example, something that you couldn't you know, make with paper. Uh, is something called the K3 surface. It exists in four real dimensions. And you can construct examples simply enough by taking products of donuts and quotient. Now, therefore, we're going to talk only about this example. Okay, now, in general, supersymmetric theories, um, they're quantities that are more robust than the full spectrum of the theory. Okay. So I talked earlier about you know, finding the spectrum of strings in this leaf flat background, which is a torus. I should emphasize that, that with these Kalabi out spaces, although we know they exist, we don't know the metric on any of them. They solve Einstein's equations. There's some metric that solves Einstein's equations. But it's never been constructed for any compact Kalabi out. Okay, so the existence of these metrics is proved, but not the form. And so there's absolutely no way we could do something like compute the partition function of strings on K3. We don't even know the metric of the space. On the other hand, there are quantities in supersymmetric theories that are more robust than the full spectrum, the full partition function. For instance, with K3, there is one choice of Ricci flat metric for each choice of Kalabi data, you can say, you know, K word class. So you could squish around the size and shape, the partition function would change, but the spectrum of certain very special states doesn't change. There's some states that would appear in a partition function that are specially simple and that you can single out on their own. Okay, these are called BPS states. Um, and the way you should think of them is that they're the lightest states in the spectrum with a given charge. And so they're exactly stable because charge conservation doesn't let them decay. Here's an example in the world. The electron is exactly stable. Why is the electron exactly stable? Uh, it's the lightest state carrying electromagnetic charge, so it can't decay. These string theories aren't realistic, but they have a lot of charges. So if you gather together all the BPS states, the lightest states with a given charge, you have a quite rich function that could count those states as a function of charge. And as I said, because they're the lightest states, they can never decay even if you switch the K3 around. So you can compute them anywhere in the space of K3 as you want, which is the simplest possible place to compute them. Then you can define an analog of the partition function, not the beautiful partition function of you know, sophomore stat mech, but a supersymmetric analog where you count not all states, but just these BPS states stable states measured by their mass. 
So you get coefficients that I'll call here dn instead of cn, because they're a subset of the states. Okay, so such an object exists. Unfortunately, mathematicians beat us to defining it, so it's called the elliptic genus, but it's just some kind of partition function. It was computed for K3 in 1989 um, by uh, Iguchi, Oguri, Karina, and Yang. And it was noticed 21 years later in 2010 that there's a moonshine phenomenon that shows up in count. Here's the phenomenon. Let's take these Ds. The first level we get 90. Second level we get 462. Third level we get 1540. This was those numbers, the 90, 462, 1540, they're in Oguri's PhD thesis in 1990. Um, 2010, people discovered that, in fact, 90 is 45 plus 45, 462 is 231 plus 231, 1540 is 770 plus 770, and these are dimensions of representations of this huge sporadic group M24. So I asked Hiroshi about this, um, and he sent me an email when I was at Caltech. Here is a copy of my PhD thesis. Please see 3.16. I did not know how to divide these by 2. Um, so the first moonshine taught us to subtract 1, so I guess it begins a whole other ball game here. Anyway, this gives a new and surprising relationship between a special modular form, the elliptic genus of K3, a finite sporadic group M24, and the stringy geometry, now a basic object in algebraic geometry, the K3 series. Now, in the old monstrous moonshine, eventually there was actually a direct proof that string theory with M symmetry exists and explains the observations in the sense that I tried to summarize here. We're not close to there yet in the new case. There's been a lot of work over the last five years on this and related questions, both from the physicists and the um, It is actually known, the simplest possible explanation would be the elliptic genus doesn't care which K3 surface you use. Choose the most symmetric crystal in K3 surface. It has M24 symmetry. That's not true. It's known as a fact that no K3 sigma model has M24 symmetry. That was proved by one of my own postdocs. It's actually known that, in fact, the full symmetries of these string theories don't even lie in M24. They're, they lie in a much larger group, one of Conway's sporadic groups. And it's also known that this setting in which I taught you about this, the K3 sigma model, string theory on the simplest lobby M manifold, is not the most general setting where the phenomenon arises. Um, there's one set of generalizations called umbral moonshine, that relate every Niemeyer lattice, it's a certain class of 24 lattices, well, 23 lattices plus the each lattice, to certain finite groups. And this is a special case of those equivalences, but none of those are understood either. So we're getting close to the end of my colloquium. This is a complicated subject. And so I had to choose between telling you things that nobody would understand and trying to introduce it. So I mostly introduce things, but now I get the obligatory five minutes where I tell you what I've been doing that you won't understand. So what we've been trying to do is leverage this discovery of moonshine in K3 compactification to find related phenomena in the models that interest most string theory more, which are these Calabia three bulk compactification. Okay, and the way this goes is something is through something called string duality, one of those relations between different string theories as you switch couplings or radii to large or small values. We've been using relations between the heterotic string on K3 times the torus and type two models on Calabia threefolds, which we discovered actually in 1995, um, to try and map forth, back and forth, facts about moonshine in K3 to facts about moonshine in Calabia manifolds. In fact, in the past year or so, we've actually been able to construct fully explicit new examples of moonshine, which are rigorous in the sense that they appeared in a math journal with a proof. Okay, and they relate a simple class of 2D string theories, conformal field theories, uh, three of Methu's groups, 7, 22, 23, and 24, which were my table of sporadic groups. Um, DPS invariants of K3, the Calabi ally introduced, and one more object, the, the mock modular form. So this would be, you know, a whole other talk. I talked about modular forms. I motivated their appearance in number theory. There's a, a larger class of objects called mock modular forms. They were discovered in 1919 in the following interesting way. You've probably all heard the story of Ramanujan. Ramanujan was an Indian mathematician who went to Cambridge worked with Hardy, discovered many startling facts in number theory, um, went back to India in 1919 at the age of 32 and died probably from five years of British food. <laughs> so in, a, in any case, when he was on his deathbed and actually his last known letter, he sent to Hardy an example, 17 examples, of functions that he, he termed startling and he called them mock theta functions by analog with theta functions, some of the most famous modular functions. 
But he didn't say what was mock theta at that point. He didn't explain what was common among the 17 functions or what properties he thought defined them. 83 years later, in 2002, a mathematician uh, in Amsterdam found three different sets of criteria that single out these 17 functions, and in fact, another space of functions, uh, and invented the notion of mock modular form, really apparently discovered by Ramanujan 83 years earlier. So these, these generalizations of modular forms now play a crucial role in this story. And the, the ongoing goal by us and by others is to understand whether these sort of hidden connections between different objects in mathematics and certain string theories might secretly govern some of the physics of quantum gravity. And I could give you very weak indications that that's true, but I'm out of time. <laughs> so let me conclude. Uh, here's what I hope you took from this talk. Moonshine relates some of the most famous objects from distinct areas of mathematics in ways that are still mysterious. This is not close to a finished subject. There is no punchline. <laughs> it seems to play well with string theory, and that's hopeful, because whatever math underlies string theory, we don't know it yet. And we may well be on the verge, not just my group, but many groups, of understanding many new examples whose implications could be as or more interesting than those of the example of fortunes. So thanks very much for your time. relationship between which I have a language uh, Obviously, since off, obviously since automorphic forms are involved, there should be a relationship with language correspondence, but I, I don't know it's simple to the answer next. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can tell you why it's called boot time. There are, there are two different answers in the historical literature, and I don't know which one is correct. One, one answer you should like in Berkeley because it's due to a Berkeley mathematician. So there's a mathematician named Arthur Hogg, or there was. Uh, I'm not sure. He must, he must have retired by now. In 1975, he noticed the following thing. Take the upper half plane that I drew you, the tau's with positive imaginary part, and ask which subgroups of SL2Z, SL2Z I introduced. Um, when you quotient the upper half plane by SL2Z, it makes that keyhole region I showed you. But you could ask, which subgroups of SL2Z, when you quotient the upper half plane to make some weird keyhole-shaped region like that, give you regions that have a technical property, that they're genus zero? What that means is if you glued all the edges together, there would be a sphere. Okay? That's a weird question to ask, but it was natural in modular functions. And he got a list of subgroups indexed by primes, and there were some number of primes, like 20 primes, okay, you know, 71, 37, whatever. But it was discovered in the construction of um, of the monster, but if you look at the order of the monster, which was already known in the mid to late 70s, the group wasn't known to exist, but if it did exist, people knew the order. The same list of primes, those same 20 primes, appear as the prime factorization of the order of the monster. And so Arthur Ogg offered a bottle of Jack Daniels to anyone who could explain to him why the genus zero subgroups of SL2Z are parameterized by the same primes that appear in the decomposition of the order of the monster. Monstrous Moonshine answers that question. And so it got somebody a bottle of Jack Daniels. <laughs> okay. There's a second answer, which is, I don't know which one is correct. John Conway played a crucial role in working out this whole story starting in the late 70s. And um, his explanation of this, there's a beautiful biography of Conway now, which I highly recommend. Um, but he talks in this book about how at a certain point in his career, he decided to hell with what is actually a legitimate map. I'm just going to do what's fun. So soon after he had this epiphany, he decided to work on these connections. And he said that he called the subject moonshine because it had the feeling, A, of something illicit like moonshine in the US, 30s or 20s or whatever that was, but also B, because it was very clear that whatever connections are being seen, they're being half illuminated at best. They're illuminated by very indirect light as by moonshine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, among modular functions, can you explain anything about the significance of the J function? Yeah. Um, if you take modular functions under SL2Z, the J function is in a, is in a preferred sense of generator. It's, it's what's called the help module, meaning under suitable conditions, every modular function um, under SL2Z is a rational function of J. So there's a real sense in which it's preferred. And in fact, there's a beautiful extension of that story to this whole Og thing I just told you, which, I, which I'm not going to describe here. But that's the real technical content of the monstrous moonshine conjecture that got worked with the field metal 
involves the appearance of help modules like J under these subgroups that, that Bob, Bob was discussing. So I'm Yeah, um, the most famous connection, uh, which is partly responsible for Ashok Sen winning this fundamental physics prize in its inaugural year, is that the, the functions that in string theory capture black hole entropy, you know, that can see in Hawking proves that black holes have entropy. The entropy is famously uh, the log of an integer, the integer number of states, right? Um, those integers are actually a beautiful number of theoretic things. In the simplest case, they are coefficients in the analog of the Q expansion of something called a Siegel modular form. Uh, there's a famous form called the Agusa cusp form. It appears in Sen's work, and it's coefficient, I'm doing a little quick, but it's roughly coefficients of the Siegel of, of this Agusa cusp form that govern the black hole entropy. In the simplest case where string theory produces the correct integers for black hole entropy. That's one famous case where, where there's been a very precise connection between string theory and number theory. To emphasize, those are not realistic black holes. They're super symmetric. They're not like real, real world black holes in any sense. So let's not overplay. Yeah. I, I can only give you my own personal answer. My own personal answer is I kind of doubt it. But, but I should emphasize that has nothing to do with string theory. So there's a very general concept called effective field theory. Every particle phenomenologist in Berkeley and every condensed matter theorist in Berkeley knows effective field theory. What it says is to understand experiments at the energy scale of this table, you don't need to know quantum chromodynamics. Um, you could understand the physics of this table using very low temperature, low energy concepts. Similarly, quantum gravity happens at a very high energy scale, as far as we know. The LHC, while it's impressive by human standards, is 17 orders of magnitude, 16 orders of magnitude below the scale where quantum gravity effects should become important. For the same reason you don't need particle physics to understand the most basic facts about this table, you don't need string theory or any theory of quantum gravity to understand the LHC. That would be my answer. It's not a popular answer, but I think it's true. So. <laughs> yeah, you have to be very lucky. There would have to be either the string scale would have to be very low or yeah, blah, blah, blah. But I think I gave the basic answer. No, there are experiments to get much closer. You know, there was there was a big New York Times article about scientists discovering the Big Bang a year ago, and what this article was about was the discovery of gravitational waves and inflation. And the experiment turned out to be correct, but the interpretation turned out to be wrong. They discovered instead gravitational waves from little clouds of dust around the Earth. But um, but had the experiment been correct and the interpretation also correct they would have seen evidence of inflationary physics at an energy scale only a factor of 100 away from the Planck scale. So you could imagine, if you're really lucky about how inflationary cosmology happened, we would get much, much closer to those energies there. I'm not saying you wouldn't see signatures of string theory or quantum gravity, but it's, it's a lot better than the LHC, which is 15 orders of magnitude. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah